Hi everyone, it's Kevin Raper from PhotoPXL. On, I'm here today again with my friend Art Wolf, and uh, we're going to be talking about one of his uh, newest books that he recently published called Wild Elephants. And uh, I have a copy of it here. It's a beautiful book. Um, there's many of Art Wolf's uh, books on my coffee table. I've got a giant coffee table in my house, um, as many of you do. And of course, this is kind of a coffee table book, I guess you could be classifying it as. Um, and this sits right with the, the book Freeze, which we talked about uh, a while back. And um, there's some other great photographers that adorn um, my coffee table. And I'm, I'm going to do a whole series sometime on my coffee table books presently, because there's it's such a collection. Uh, actually, it, it'll kind of be a, a story about what books you better have or should have on your coffee table. And I'm proud that right now I have at least two of Art's books on my coffee table, not to mention a whole ton of them in, um, in my bookcase. So Art, welcome. Thank you. It's always fun to see you. Um, so let's talk about this, this book. Uh, this book for those that are interested is uh, 252 pages, 12 by 12, and must weigh about eight pounds, gorgeous book. And it's filled with the most magnificent animals. So. Art, where, where did this idea come from? What did it take to do? How many years did you have to photograph? Talk a little bit about this book because I haven't seen anything that give you an appreciation of wild elephants out there and the challenges that they face. And there's quite a few um, and maybe you'll kind of brief us about that. But it's such a gorgeous piece to sit down and look at and read with a glass of wine or tequila or whatever your, your, your choice is and thoroughly stoke it up. Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, the first time Kevin and I went to Africa, I went there to climb Kilimanjaro. And after having summited, I remember going out with uh, the three people I was traveling with from Seattle and we went into the Serengeti. And um, I can remember seeing the first elephant herd and I was less than interested in photographing them because I was all about spots. I wanted to see a leopard, I wanted to see a cheetah, and, you know, the elephants are kind of big gray animals. And yet, over the years, you just become so fixated on them because though they're big and one color, they are so animated and they're just a marvel to watch. And over the years then, as I matured and really appreciated these uh, great animals, I started, of course, photographing them in every way and shape that I could. And with time, I built up quite an archive on elephants. Um, you know, I'm working on seven books on a normal basis, and I give these books time to develop. And for instance, on the average, I'm putting nine years into a book, but multiple books at one time. My publisher came to me, and, uh, you know, I stick with one publisher at this point, and he came to me with the idea of doing an elephant book because, you know, he, uh, it, it it's pretty obvious for a lot of people in the environmental world that elephants are being poached still. You know, we think we know and how to stop the poaching, but in fact, it's going on and on and on. And it's the greed of people uh, that want to make money off these animals. And so the publisher wanted to approach it from that perspective. And a good friend of mine, Sam Wasser, also from Seattle, is a modern day sleuth. He has now mapped the DNA of all elephants in Africa. So he can take a look at ivory that's been, uh, you know, uh, captured from the poachers and tell exactly what country that ivory is coming from. And that has enabled a lot of the local authorities to start to stem a lot of the poaching that's going on. But Sam in his text talks about tracing the ivory that often goes out through Khartoum in the Sudan, out to the Arabian Peninsula, out to Asia. And he has now identified the kingpins in the elephant ivory trade. And so though the photos in the book, I'm very proud of, it's the text of Sam Wasser that I'm even more proud of because it's bringing to new light what's happening in the world of elephants and poaching and the ivory trade. From my perspective, I could draw from all the years I've been photographing elephants, but in fact, when I take on a project, then I jump in with both feet and 
target what I need to get. And part of that then was to go into the country of Chad and get in a, um, a plane above the largest herd of elephants in Africa, some 400 animals in one herd and photograph aerial perspectives of this mass of elephants that remind me of the great work of Peter Beard that he photographed in East Africa back in the 50s and 60s. And so it was a great project to work on. I'm very happy with the publisher. He did a great job on presenting the work and allowing the words of Sam Wasser to you know, shine through. Tell me a little bit about the publisher. It's called Earthwick. Earthware. So it obviously seems to be a publisher that wants to do books along this line in regards to, you know, the world and the environment and some of the, the causes today. Um, well, the publisher uh, himself is Raul Joff and um, Goff, and he is working out of San Rafael, California. He has Insight Editions, and um, Raul's first started uh, in the business being a paper broker. Uh, providing and uh, getting paper for other publishers. But as he grew into this, he be uh, started his own publishing company. And his friend, uh, uh, George Lucas, L is a neighbor of his. And so he, uh, Raul, published uh, Lucas's big books on Star Wars, which kind of gave him the footprint and the entree into the world of doing fine art books and big books. And then as Raul is very sensitive and aware of the environment, he created the imprint of Earth Aware Books within that. And so he's got a journey. And what I like about Raul is that his taste in art and uh, perspective on nature and photography is very synonymous with mine. And so it's a perfect match. And so I love working with the gentleman. He did my first book, a uh, big book with him was called Earth is Our Witness. And he's done Trees of the World, which at first glance, I thought, oh my God, how interesting could a book on trees be? And yet it was a fascinating book and really uh, shows, it showcases the variety of these great plants. And the, the, uh, we, we would tag that book with Trees Are the Lungs of the Planet. And so every book had a slant and Wild Elephants really was talking about the great animals that we have the chance of losing and what a loss it would be to the entire earth if elephants disappeared from the African continent. Yeah, this, I mean, when I look at the design of this book, and of course you will have some overlays, but I mean, just this double page thread, um, you know, with just the elephant in the bottom right corner and the whole environment, uh, along with so many other images in this book, are, are just mind opening. I love this one of the eye. Um, oh, yeah. And then that's so typical because you shoot your landscapes that way, but to see you shooting the wildlife that way with the textures and the abstracts of, of the skin, there's several beautiful images throughout this book um, that, that illustrate that. You have a centerpiece with elephants on a plane with, that's done in black and white. So you alternate between black and white in color. You've got some where you've got the zebras in the field. I mean, overhead shots. It, this is a journey. I mean, literally, when you pick the book up, open it for the first time, you know, you feel like you're 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 with art, shooting these magnificent animals. Um, so it, it it's quite stunning. Did um, the publisher do the layout too, or how much did you have input in regards to putting that project together? You know, I've learned over the years that. It takes a village to bring out a nice book. I'm going to provide the best photos that I possibly can. And though I would love to pick every photo and lay the book out, I also realize the best books come from the collaboration of people that are invested in it. So I generally won't interfere with a designer or the publisher. And what I love about Raul is he's got a huge uh, group of people that work with him on multiple books but he loves to get in there and make final selections. And if there's sometimes my favorite photo has been overlooked, I can get that in. I tend to allow people to do their work and I've run my own office that way. I've got five very capable people and they run their own divisions within Art Wolf. And you know, they are the masters of that, that piece of the pie. And so, 
And to think about it, I'm on the road working on the next book and so, or the next project. So I've got to be reliant on the intelligence of the people that work with me. And that also includes the publisher, their designers, their editors, the writers, all of it bring out the best in what they have to offer and brings uh, and makes the book a stronger volume. Well, they do a very good job. You've got a great introduction to the book and, and Dr. Wasser, um, who, who did the text in the book, just like your trees book, really opens up your eyes to what's, what's going on. But let me ask you a question. Um, uh, I'm watching that, that series about Queen Elizabeth um, on, uh, on Netflix, I think it is. And there was an episode early on where they went to Africa and they're trying to get to this like tree house or overlook. And there's these elephants there and they, they made it out to be like these elephants are really mean and you know, could trample you to death and stuff. You know, having been with you to see the bears and learn that, you know, the bears don't really care about us, although, you know, it doesn't mean you just go out and do them uh, and photograph them. Same with polar bears. There's, uh, you, you need to know what you're doing and where the limitations are. But, I mean, we, you've got elephants running. I mean, weren't you afraid somewhere along the line that, uh, you know, the way some of these shots are shown, shown that uh, there's danger to you? There's definitely danger, and elephants are perfectly capable of trampling somebody to death. Uh, and I've seen the very elephants that have killed people. Um, but that is generally a reaction to where an uh, elephant, which has a great memory and uh, never forgets, or so we believe, if people have speared elephants or shot at elephants and killed family members, they make the association with humans on foot as being an enemy. And they may in fact charge you. And I've been charged by an enraged mother. And fortunately I survived the attack. Uh, we were on foot in a forest in Zimbabwe. And you know, that elephant had been um, interacted with in a negative way by people before it entered the preserve that we're in. There's no doubt about it. So it was carrying forward a bad memory of human interaction. And yet on that same day, we were able to walk within 15 feet of another herd. We always uh, stayed close to trees if we had to dodge behind it, but the elephants knew we were there. They were very casual, very relaxed and enabled us to get very close to them. So it's really on an individual basis. If you encounter a, a, her, a breeding herd, which is females and ants and tiny babies in a truly wild area, um, they're very protective of that animal and they're very capable of outrunning a vehicle on a dirt bumpy road in remote Africa. So, you know, it's all over the map. You have to have profound respect for these great animals and know that if the animal has never had a negative experience with humans, they're likely to be very chilled, um, but you never know the story. And so you have to be uh, wise to all of that. You normally have pretty good guides with you that know this? Yeah, uh, on the encounter where this enraged elephant ran so fast at us, and uh, fortunately there was a dead tree on the ground with branches that had embedded themselves into the, the land. And so they were like a kickstand on this tree. And the elephant hit that tree with such an impact that shards of wood went flying over our heads. And it had a second charge. And, and by that time, it had blown off its anger and turned around and ran away with his calf. But had it not been for that tree, there's no doubt that we would have been injured or killed by that attack. And that animal was, there was no two things about it. It was coming for us ran straight at us and um, hit that tree with great force. I know you have a, a number of other stories like that. One of the things that I, I just, you, you recently were photographing crocodiles or alligators in Mexico, I think it was, or something. That yeah. one's, I, I, I thought you lost your marbles with some of the pictures I saw from that one. Yeah, you know, they were 10 to 12 foot uh, American saltwater crocodiles. And they, and I was assured by our guides that they've not had an injury involving these animals. And so I'm relying on that. I always go with the risk and the rewards. And to me, if nobody's been injured and people can get in the water. So I got in the water and, you know, they're all teeth. They're all just teeth and they're coming straight up to you. 
And I'm like hiding behind the dome port of my underwater housing. And the, the snout of the beast comes straight up and stops at the glass of the uh, underwater camera. And that, and, and yet I found those animals kind of endearing, you know, they're so grotesque and frightening. There's an allure to them. And what happens is in, on this border with Belize and Southern Mexico, the local lobster fishermen have these shacks that are out over the, uh, the reefs. And over the years, they've hucked fish parts out into the water and crocodiles have learned that these shacks are, when humans are there, might be food. And so they all kind of congregate around these stilted shacks and the water is about three feet deep. And suddenly you look down and there's like an 11, 10, 12 foot uh, crocodile. So you get in the water and you get, you know, you're kind of walking in three feet of water and you wait and these crocodiles come straight up to you, but none of them were aggressive towards us. But it's, I mean, when you look at the photos, you think, oh my they God. They were amazing, just like your, your elephant pictures. And I remember, if you, you remember when we were hanging off the boat in the, the Kimberley and we had an underwater housing and, you know, we're photographing uh, this, these sharks that would come up to the boat yeah. and we watched an alligator attack a shark. I never would have thought I would have seen that in my, all my life. It was just amazing. Yeah, I would never, by the way, do that with saltwater crocs in Australia because they've had a history of taking humans and the American crocodiles for, uh, they're just a different um, spe subspecies. They tend not to interfere with humans. And for the most part, they take wading birds in shallows. And so their whole diet is different than humans. Whereas saltwater crocs in North Australia have taken a number of people over the years. Yeah, that was kind of like, okay, and I know we, I sent pictures home and people, what, why isn't anybody swimming? <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's like Australia, everything's trying to eat you down here. And, you know, it's just the way it was. Um, this book is an amazing book, Art. Um, just out of curiosity, since we were talking about alligators, is that going to be a project in the book someday, maybe? Or? Uh, yeah, I mean, I've got seven books under contract right now, one of which is called Wild. And it's a look at international wildlife during the Anthropocene, which is the age of man. And it will showcase how animals are adapting to increased human presence and animals are uh, changing their behaviors because of climate change. So it's an up-to-date look at international wildlife uh, with under the guise of the Anthropocene. So that book will definitely, uh, that photo will definitely be part of that project. And another project is called Act of Faith, which looks at world religion. And it's not just you know, Muslims and Christians and Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, but it's also shamanism and voodoo. So that will make the book um, very interesting. And, and in the fall of this year, we have a book called Night on Earth, and it's both urban culture, rural culture, wildlife and landscapes all shot at night. Excellent. Well, you know, I've, I've seen a lot of these images. I can't wait to see them in the book. Um, I, I remember the first time I visited you in Seattle when you still had your gallery down by the stadium there. Um, and I just couldn't believe there was a, what do you call it, a nook or a cove or, you know, bookshelves with all the books that you have done. And I just said, this is just ridiculous. How does anybody do this many books? I have a hard time getting a blurb book out the door. <laughs> so, you know, my hat's off to you there. And especially uh, Wild Elephants, it's uh, quite an accomplishment, much like your trees uh, book is too. So um, as readers and viewers of this, you should really start a collection. If you haven't done a book collection, and every photographer should have a book collection. Um, there are so many books out there that not only are beautiful books to look at, but beautiful books to inspire you uh, about where you might want to go and uh, how you would like to shoot. But they're, they're collector's pieces. Well, and I'm uh, exactly like you. I've got a library that's filled with so many of my colleagues' works, but also painters. I love my library. It uh, oh. look, uh, outlooks, overlooks the Japanese garden outside. So I'm surrounded by creative people's works. 
and the nature and I'm upbeat. You, you can see that. And I, I believe that. And I teach that in my workshops that if your psychology is running on a high level, you remain happier and uh, longer lived and healthier uh, and all those right things. So I think people need to fill their lives with art and creativity and it doesn't necessarily mean photography it could be dance it could be poetry it could be cooking for that matter it could be anything where you are inspired by the things you're involved with as opposed to constantly being entertained by the works of others so yes. you know yes. pick up the camera pick up the brush pick up you know the darning needles or whatever it may be but find something that you can create and uh, have a reason to get out of bed yeah uh, i much like you, my, I have a reading room, which is my living room, and it's just where everything is. We, the whole one whole wall is nothing but glass. Out look, looking out over a, a little waterfall and garden that we have, uh, nothing quite as elaborate as yours, but it's it's that place where you go and you you, you let out a breath and you just feel good. And yeah, you pick up a yeah. book and put it on your lap and um, just, you know, you lose your mind for half an hour somewhere. And then when you're finished, it's like, oh, yeah, do I feel better or what? Well, you know, it's interesting, Kevin, is that this year, everywhere I went into wilderness, there were so many people uh, on the trails, in the mountains, along the ocean, and the need for nature was so much in evidence. And yeah, sometimes the trails were too crowded with people, but they were wearing masks. But I think the overarching uh, thing I took away was nature heals and people need to expose themselves. And if it's just the city park or a patch of woods in your neighborhood, it is healing and people need it. It's a primal necessity of modern humans. And so, um, you know, as far as we go forward, I hope um, more and more lands will be set aside and preserved and um, because the human psychology absolutely needs it. Well, now that we're into a new political environment, maybe some of the lands that were given away in the last four years might be reclaimed by us. Which undoubtedly, is, undoubtedly, that's true. So. Anyway, Art, uh, as always, spending time with you, whether it's through Zoom or out in the field or wherever we might be, is quite the pleasure. Um, it's always an inspiration and a privilege uh, to, to spend time talking to you, especially uh, reading your books, um, this is this book is extremely good. All the information for um, ordering the book and everything will be in the article, as well as uh, some of your other books and, and projects. Um, don't want to don't want to forget that even though we've covered this in another video, uh, you do have Pathways to Creativity, which is another series you can get, which will inspire you. Um, you're just full of stuff, Art. I mean, luckily you got a team of people that help you get this stuff out the door. I just have little old me these days and. You know, it's it's a it's a process, but uh, uh, you you are continually inspire not only myself, but I know tons of other people, and um, I really look forward to getting back out there and and shooting with you somewhere along the line. And I know we'll be giving you a call. Maybe we'll just do a ride up to the Rockies or Canadian Rockies or something, and you know, have some fun time with some of our friends and uh, see what we can do. But uh, get your vaccine. Um, you know, let's get this world safe again and try to get back out there and do what we love to do. It's a new world and we've a lot of things that are happening. But, uh, and I hate to use this word because I was telling somebody about this the other day, but just like you did with the Pathways to Creativity, we sort of have to reinvent ourselves along that path and adapt. It's no different than wildlife does to the environmental changes and everything else. So, you know, rethink things, break the paradigm, you know, do something different, but more than anything else, just get out there and do it. Good words. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks, Art, um, very much for being part of this. Um, I hope uh, the readers enjoy your book. I know that uh, a bunch of them will probably say, oh, I'm gonna get this book and, and take part in it. So as always, thank your staff um, who I work with quite closely. Thank you for all the adventures that we've had in our day and probably the countless bottles of tequila we've tossed back. <laughs> And, uh, you know, stay safe, okay? And, All right, um, I will do that. Thank you, Kevin. We'll be in touch, and we're going to be shooting together again. And to my readers, um, thank you very much for being here. Thank you much for uh, supporting PhotoPXL and in our endeavors to enhance your vision and 
Uh, I hope you like these conversations that we've been doing. And uh, maybe sometime soon, um, Chris Sanderson and Art and I will be sitting on a rock somewhere and doing our conversations outside where we used to do them. So uh, until then, uh, please stay safe and uh, see you all soon. Art, once again, thanks. All right. Thanks, Kevin.